On the broadcast tonight, fate of Kaesong. Seoul is not budging an inch when it comes to the implementation of strong safeguards to prevent another work stoppage at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex. We take a look at the fate of the last remaining joint project between the two Koreas. Good news and bad. Samsung Electronics reports new records in sales and operating profit and the continued popularity of its high-end smartphones, but its shrinking mobile business takes the shine off the glory. And Spain train crash as the death toll in Spain's worst rail crash in decades rises to 80. Questions are being raised about how the train was allowed to travel at up to twice the legal speed limit. This is Early Edition at 6. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 10 in London, and 6 on a Friday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Kwon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for tuning in. The sixth round of inter-Korean talks did not end on a high note. After a sixth round of talks between the two Koreas and reopening their joint Kaesang Industrial Complex broke down on Thursday, South Korea is talking tough, saying the North must accept its preconditions or face grave action. Meanwhile, the South Korean companies with factories in the complex have begun to appeal for a compromise and a resumption of business there. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang Sung-hee has our top story. A day after the sixth round of inter-Korean talks effectively collapsed, South Korea's Unification Ministry reiterated its stance that safeguards against future closures must be implemented before the Kaesong Industrial Complex is reopened. South Korea made several proposals to raise the global competitiveness of the complex by adhering to international standards that are within the realm of common sense. North Korea must consider the issue seriously and show a change in its stance. Unification Ministry spokesperson Kim hyung suk warned that Seoul would take brave action if Pyongyang does not make a sincere effort to reach agreement on preventive measures against the complex's closure. Although he did not elaborate on what that action would be, many expect it could be linked to the closure of the factory zone. The parties most disappointed by news of the collapse of Thursday's talks were the South Korean firms with factories across the border. In frustration, a group representing the businesses paid a visit to the Unification Ministry on Friday and met with Vice Minister Kim Nam-sik and the South Korean Chief Delegate Kim Gi-young. The business representative said that the damage from the near four-month-long suspension of the complex has been too great and said that the two Koreas must make compromises to reach a concrete agreement on the matter. However, the two sides seem to be far from making any compromises. With no set date for additional talks, experts say that the momentum for dialogue between the two has been broken and that the most likely scenario for now is a continuation of the current prolonged suspension of the complex. Hwang sang Arirang News. Meanwhile, Chinese Vice President Lee Yuan Chao is in North Korea for Korean War ceasefire commemorations and has reportedly met face to face with North Korean leader Kim Jong un. Arirang's Hwang Ji Hae reports on what the two talked about. Chinese Vice President Lee Wian Chao reportedly made it clear to North Korean leader Kim Jong un that his country is committed to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. China's state-run Xinhua News Agency says that Lee urged North Korea during talks on Thursday to scrap the country's nuclear weapons program as a means to maintain peace and stability in the region. The vice president went on to say that problems should be solved through dialogue and negotiations and pushed for a resumption of the long-stalled six-party talks. Kim, in response, reportedly said that Pyongyang supports China's efforts to restart the six-party talks. The North's official Korean Central News Agency, meanwhile, reported Friday that Kim told the Chinese delegation that Pyongyang, quote, will always remember China's assistance during the Korean War. 
Lee is currently visiting North Korea as the head of a Chinese delegation for the 60th anniversary on Saturday of the Korean War Armistice Agreement. Lee is the highest ranking Chinese official to visit Pyongyang since Kim Jong un came to power. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. U.S. President Barack Obama has named this Saturday Korean War Veterans Armistice Day. July 27th marks the 60th anniversary since the Korean War Armistice was signed, halting the three year war. In his proclamation, President Obama said all Americans should observe the day with appropriate ceremonies and activities to honor the bravery and sacrifices made by the country's Korean War veterans. The president will give a speech Saturday at the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington. Over 320,000 American troops fought in the Korean War. More than 30,000 U.S. soldiers were killed and 8,000 went missing in action. Now, 60 years ago, on July 27th, officials representing the United Nations Command, China and North Korea sat down at Korea's border village of Panmunjom to sign the Korean Armistice Agreement that brought a ceasefire that brought a ceasefire to the three-year-long bloody conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Unfortunately, a truce, not a peace treaty, meaning the two Koreas sharply divided at the 38th parallel are technically still at war. To commemorate this special anniversary, our Handaun sat down with a Swedish representative of the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission to talk about the past, present and future of the two Koreas. Rear Admiral Anders Grunstad is a Swedish representative of the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, an organization established right after the armistice agreement was signed with the aim of overseeing the military activities of both South and North Korea. In advance of the 60th anniversary of the truce, the general offered a few words on the current status of the agreement. I think uh, the armistice agreement has served uh, Korea, both Koreas well. Even if it's probably the longest uh, armistice agreement in the world, it has worked. Both sides have been playing to 95 percent to the rules anyhow. Admiral Grenstad acknowledged, however, that tensions on the Korean Peninsula remain high. I think we all can sense tension, and especially us who are sitting in the DMC, who see North Korean soldiers every day. We have been here now for 60 years, um, and um, since 1995, North Korea do not speak with us. Yes, we can feel that it is tensed because we don't know what's going to happen next. With regard to North Korea's attempt to scrap the 60-year-old truce earlier this year, the general said he presumes the reclusive state had a reason. With the collapse of Soviet Union, a very strong uh, South Korea, a strong uh, alliance, uh, South Korea, U.S., and the China. North Korea becomes a very uh, isolated state in the the former old Stalinist communism. So, of course, an armistice, an armistice agreement then is not really in their favor. They want something else to replace it. Admiral Grenstad also pointed out that North Korea has to change before the reunification of the two Koreas can take place. He said South Korea has tried a lot of things to engage the North in dialogue, but as long as the North continue to take the path of isolation, things would always go back to square one. He also added that the NNSC should not be in Korea for one day longer than it has to, and when the two Koreas settle on a peace pact to replace the current armistice agreement, he'll be happy to go home. And then, I did a news. So, American and South Korean officials and veterans will commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice Agreement in the U.S. and South Korea this week. Now, signed on July 27, 1953, the ceasefire agreement brought the uh, brutal three-year conflict to an end. The Armistice Agreement created the demilitarized zone that served as a buffer zone and the factor border between South and North Korea. How have the two states evolved since then, and where do we stand now in terms of our relations? Joining us live to give us some perspective is Dr. Kim Jang-ho, research fellow at the 
Korea Institute for National Unification. Dr. Kim, thank you for joining us again. Well, it's great to be back. <coughs> All right, uh, Dr. Kim, let's start by discussing inter-Korean relations. I mean, where we stand today, six decades since the end of the conflict. Uh, first, the military equation, uh, now six years after the Korean War armistice. Well, um, contrary to uh, what we want to believe or what the uh, popular public opinion is, we do not have an overwhelming um, edge over uh, North Korea's uh, conventional forces, unfortunately. Um, army, that is the land forces, in fact, uh, North Korea has the edge in that, in that field. Uh, sheer, well, primarily down to their numerical advantage in terms of infantry, as well as uh, um, tanks, artillery, uh, things like this. In terms of our naval forces, I think we're about even. They have the advantage in, in numerical numbers, yet we uh, have ships that are better equipped, a little bit more technologically advanced. Uh, where we do have an advantage is in our, in our Air Force, where, where our fighter aircraft will, would immediately, I think, if hostilities broke out, would be able to take um, control of the, uh, the air. And taking control of the air is very important these days. You usually don't have to stay in land. You fly over the war zone and kind of take care of business along the way. So I guess that gives us somewhat of a positive advantage there. Mm -hmm. Moving on to a different story, what about the economic paths that the two states have taken? Uh, in terms of relations economically, we were just giving and giving and giving. And finally, we have something going on with the joint industrial complex. Uh, but uh, we still don't know what the future holds for that at the mm -hmm. moment. Well, I think as for the economic paths that these two, well, we and North Korea have taken um, during the past 60 years, it's, the outcome is obvious. Uh, I think we, we are a legitimate part of the international community, uh, thriving economically, doing well. Whereas North Korea, the 20 some odd million people are suffering uh, due to the uh, incapabilities of uh, the Kim regime in terms of their economic policies. As for Kaesong, um, I think we saw today uh, that, that um, our government is, is pretty much running out of patience, um, that, that we, without a guarantee of this happening again, uh, that is uh, a dramatic uh, shutting off of, of the area entirely, uh, unilaterally by the North Korea. Unless this, there is a mechanism to be prevent this from happening again, I think our government is, is inclined not to uh, continue. All right, uh, we'll have to wait and see how that develops on the Kaesong front. Now, 60 years ago, we were at the height of the Cold War. Of course, that's no longer the case. Uh, the geopolitical and diplomatic environment uh, have uh, gone through a huge change. Uh, but would you say the situation is completely different from back then, or would you say um, it's more of the same, however, just in different intensity? It's both different and same at the same time um, because it's different in the sense that we now commensurate to our economic strength, our place in the world. Uh, we are able to exercise diplomacy that, that shape our future, uh, whereas in 60 years ago we did not have that. Um, North Korea is an isolated country that's isolated from the international community. They're running out of resources, whatnot. So, in, in that equation, I think we have the upper hand in terms of uh, diplomatic uh, leverage and, and activities concerning our diplomacy. But I think it's, in, it's still the same in that we're still divided. And we still work in an environment that's what we experts call a bipolar structure. Uh, that, is, that is, the maritime powers led primarily by the United States. Uh, and, and the continental powers led primarily during the Cold War by the Soviet Union, of course, now by China. Um, and China supporting North Korea and we being supported by uh, the United States through our alliance. So structurally, there isn't much difference. But I think that we are now capable of shaping uh, that structure to a certain degree in our favor. Now, can we focus a little bit on the ROC US or the U.S., Korea, South Korea alliance in terms of military power. We did hear a lot of stories coming up about OPCON transfer and, of course, the cost sharing. So maybe some people outside might be concerned if this relationship or this solid alliance might be relatively weaker than before. What's your take on that? 
Um, I, I think, uh, on the contrary, in, in terms of um, its, its uh, political foundations, it's, it's really stronger than ever. Um, it's, it, remember, this Korean War started 63 years ago, primarily because, well, I guess in part, because we did not have an alliance with the United States. In fact, in 19, early 1950, uh, Dean Acheson, then the Secretary of the United States, uh, declared that declared the Korean Peninsula to be outside the United States defense perimeter, which included Japan, excluded South Korea. And I'm sure this, this played into the calculation that Kim Il-sung was making in his so-called effort to liberalize, I mean, uh, liberalize um, South Korea from the imperial forces of the United States. According to him. According to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, so the United States, um, our alliance with the United States is s still certainly needed in that sense. Um, and also with the equation, with what North Korean nuclear threat brings into the equation, I think we still need the United States, in fact, more than ever in terms of that nuclear deterrence that, that would provide the peace of mind to, to continue on our um, way of life here in South Korea. So uh, the RK-US alliance being uh, very strong today mm -hmm. and, uh, and that it is actually quite needed uh, where we stand today as well. Now let's talk about the way July 27th, uh, the day of the Korean War armistice, is celebrated uh, between um, the two Koreas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much perceived differently. Uh, where, how is that possible? Where does this difference in perspective come from? Yeah, it's ironic that uh, we're both they in North Korea and we here in South Korea are celebrating uh, the date of the uh, armistice uh, 60 years on. And this is primarily down to, to the different perception or, or the false perception that I think that they have. They believe that they, they repel the Americans. That Number one, they, they believe that we started, South Korea started the Korean War um, or the American puppets, according to them, uh, led by, of course, Lee Seung man our president back then. Um, then, and that they were, along with the Chinese, able to repel the, the expansionistic tendencies of U.S. imperialism. Um, so thus, they, we have Chinese officials visiting North Korea, joining North Korea for that festivity. And, and on the other hand, in, in South Korea, elsewhere in the world, um, I don't think we're only celebrating, but we're paying tribute to, to those who fought in the cause to, to make that well, make the platform in, on which South Korea today is, 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 is possible. Um, um, how laying the foundations for, for the political and the economic development that, that we have uh, achieved in the past 60 years, paying tribute to, to those uh, who have uh, particularly uh, given their lives uh, for that effort. Mm -hmm. I think the world has now moved on from the days of the Cold War to, to, to see that, that it, it, it really was a war to, to, to um, prevent communism from spreading and, and, and um, giving South Korea an opportunity to take part in, 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 in the world that, that we know today. Okay, in terms of the security situation on the Korean Peninsula, what lies ahead? What are some of the biggest homeworks for the Park Geun-hye administration? Mm. Um, well, as I said, I think we still live in a bipolar structured international environment and, and thus uh, our alliance with the United States is perennially still important. And I think she's managing that well, of course, um, as did the previous administration of Yi um, Jung bak I think she, what, she needs, and she, what she needs to do now is, is to convince China um, in our effort to denuclearize North Korea. Um, and I think she did a good job in, in laying the foundations for that in her recent visit to China. And I hope she can continue on that path in, in, in convincing. It will, be a big, it will be a very tiring, strenuous effort because China still thinks of North Korea as a strategic buffer, strategic, strategic asset that will help them in, 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 in their competition with the United States. We need to, to convince China that that's not the case. And I think um, she's, she's striking a, a good balance in between uh, our efforts towards the United States as well as China. 
So there's a lot of work uh, to be done, and it's, it's a sad fact that um, the situation is no more less complicated now than it was 60 years ago. Um, but it is on, the, um, on a positive note, we have moved on from that era, and uh, we hope for a better future together. All right, Dr. Kim Jang-ho, Research Fellow at Korea Institute for National Unification. Thank you for today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Now, Samsung Electronics reported yet another quarter of record sales and profits. The world's largest maker of smartphones, memory chips, and TV said its profit rose nearly 50% in the second quarter of this year thanks to robust shipments of smartphones and higher chip prices. However, even its best performance yet fell short of analysts' expectations, and investors remain worried that demand for top-shelf smartphones like the Samsung Galaxy S4 is slowing down. Arirang News, Ji Myung-gil reports. Despite the prolonged economic crisis in Europe and China's slowing economy, Samsung Electronics posted a record operating profit of $8.5 billion in the second quarter of this year. That's a whopping increase of 47.5 percent from a year earlier. Samsung logged sales of $51 billion U.S. dollars in the second quarter, a 20 percent increase from the same period last year. Both sales and profits kept increasing in consumer electronics, semiconductors and panel display business. But the Korean tech giant is increasingly facing pressure to produce innovative smartphones to stay as the number one handset maker. Its mobile business is the biggest cash generator, but the division's profit fell 3.5 percent from the previous quarter, although it jumped 52 percent from a year earlier to $5.5 billion. The loss of a major deal with Apple caused a drop in sales of its logic chips, but soaring prices of memory chips allowed the world's largest memory chip maker to report a 70 percent jump in the semiconductor division's profit to $1.5 billion. Logic chips serve as the brains of computers and other digital devices, while memory chips are used to hold memory for computing devices. Samsung's fate depends largely on its smartphone business. But with slowing sales of its flagship Galaxy S4, concerns are mounting that its handset profit margin may fall. Samsung plans to invest around $21.5 billion in upgrading its production facilities this year. Kim young Arirang News. And on a more somber note, Spain is observing three days of national mourning for the victims of Wednesday's deadly train crash. As the country still comes to terms with the horrific accident that killed at least 80 people, the police are now questioning the driver. There's growing speculation the train was going twice the speed limit when it derailed. Our Connie Lee has more. This security video shows a terrifying moment. The train flew off the tracks in northwestern Spain on Wednesday. In the blink of an eye, the train speeding down the tracks derails as it turns into the bend. Train cars smash into a wall, crashing so powerfully that parts of the train even fly over the wall. Crews are now cleaning up the area, where some carriages lay twisted and ripped in half, others charred by fire. A spokesperson for the Spanish government has confirmed at least 80 people were killed in the crash and more than 130 are injured, many seriously. Investigators are now questioning one of the two drivers amid speculation that the train was traveling too fast. Spanish media reports that the 52-year-old driver had even boasted about traveling at high speeds on Facebook. This screen grab of the alleged Facebook photo from March 2012 shows a speedometer at 200 kilometers an hour. The driver is said to have worked for the state-owned train company Renfe for the past 30 years. The train, with 247 people on board, was traveling from Madrid to Spain's coastal city of Ferrol when it crashed near Santiago de Compostela. Many people were headed to Santiago for one of Europe's biggest Christian festivals, 
but the festival has been canceled out of respect to the victims. On Thursday, Spain declared three days of national mourning over the crash, which was the worst rail disaster the country has seen in 40 years. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And now it's time for weather. That means we turn to our Hannah Kim. Hannah, the sun was out in full force today and the Gyeongsang provinces are still under heat wave warnings at this hour, right? That's right, Daniel. Temperatures are soaring over the 30s today and Milyang even reached 36.2 degrees Celsius. Oh, you know, Hannah, that's just way, way too hot. But, you know, I'm sure those people who are on vacation are happy, at least because they aren't seeing rain. So can we expect more sunshine over the weekend? You actually can, Kanyang, until tomorrow. Tomorrow, we should have mostly clear skies in the morning, but it should get gradually cloudier by the afternoon. You may also witness some light scattered showers in the central west, probably less than five millimeters of rainfall, but the real precipitation should begin on Sunday. With the monsoon front getting stronger, stronger we will have uh, more uh, scattered rain centralized in the central provinces. If we take a closer look at the forecast, Seoul will start off the morning at 23 and reach 32 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the Gyeongsang provinces have been having a blazing heat wave as temperatures in uh, cities like Daegu and Busan peak to 35 and 30 degrees respectively. Down on Jeju Island, we have overcast skies. Tejun will hit 33 while Tokyo tops out at 26. Well, that's all I have for you today. I'm Hannah Kim. Have a wonderful weekend. And that's a wrap. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you right back here same time Monday evening. Good night.